I want to speak to the men today and also a message that will relate to all of you in some way. I ask you to join me in Matthew chapter 17. We'll begin at verse 14, Matthew 17, verse 14. It says, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus, knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. Now I want to skip down and I'll pick up the reading at the end of verse 17. Bring the boy here to me. This is Jesus talking. And then Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Now, Matthew, Mark, and John all write about this, and they all place this experience of the dad and his son and Jesus right after what took place on the mountain of transfiguration. That is in the first part of chapter 17, and it goes like this. Jesus had asked Peter, James, and John to go with him, and they climbed that mountain when they got to the top, the time came, and the Bible says that the face of Jesus started shining as bright as the sun. It didn't stop there. It says that even his clothing became white and radiant with light. So there's something awesome taking place. In addition to that, showing up on that mountain was Moses and Elijah. And the Bible says that Moses and Elijah started talking to Jesus. So here's Jesus' face shining, his clothes radiating, and now Moses and Elijah, men of the Old Testament, now present on that mountain talking. And it's there that Peter speaks for the first time. And I love what he says. It's like he doesn't want to interrupt the conversation, but he says, hey, hey, by the way, I, I just want to say it's really good for me to be here. It's right there. He says, it's good for me. And it's his way of saying, I am so glad I got included. Like Moses, I've talked so much about you because I've heard so much about you. Elijah, we've heard so much about you. Everybody talks about you. Now I'm getting to listen to you talk to Jesus. And not only did they continue talking, but something else happens there's a cloud, and it's not just any cloud. It was the way in their humanity, they're trying to describe what was happening. It was a cloud that came down, and it was the very glory of God, the glory, not the fame of God, but the presence, the weight of the presence of God. And then God spoke. Now, before I get into what God said, just be reminded of in the context what we are seeing in Moses is representation of the law. What we are seeing in Elijah is representation of all the prophets. And the apex is Jesus. Jesus is the culmination of the law and the prophets. As it relates to the law and the prophets, Jesus is better, greater than. That's according to the writing of Hebrews. Here you have Moses who died, and now he's on that mountain. Elijah, who never died, he was taken by this chariot, just raptured, if you will. And so this entire experience is so full of theological truth. You have Moses who could say, hey, uh, grave, where is your sting? And Elijah saying, death, where is your victory? A representation, whether by rapture or resurrection, if you know Jesus, the day comes where you will be in the manifest presence of Jesus. And uh, Peter's like, don't want to interrupt this, but uh, I can also build stuff and I'd love to build some shelters. I can build one for you, Moses, and you, Elijah, so that we never have to leave. Just absolutely love the scripture and and Peter, rightfully so, just taken by the weight, the significance of what is happening. This cloud of the presence of God is then topped off by the voice of God. 
And God speaks. God says of Jesus, this is my son in whom I love and in him I am well pleased. He's my son, I love him, I'm proud of him. That's gonna be significant to today's message, especially this first challenge. Let me set up our way of receiving the power of what we've just seen by reminding you that between 1495 and 1498, Da Vinci painted the mural called The Last Supper. In his artistic brilliance, he tried to capture even the soul of each of those apostles by the detail that he painted into their faces, into giving personality and just amazing. However, time, history had a way of diminishing the brilliance of his artistry. Just the humidity, the dirty air, started to smudge the painting over time. Then in the 1800s, Napoleon and his troops occupied the very place where he had done the mural. He had painted it in a monastery, actually in the dining hall of the monastery in Milan, Italy. Napoleon's troops occupied that very space. It's where they kept their weapons, and their horses, so they turned that space into an armory and a stable. Just that alone continued to have negative impact on the painting. Those troops were known to have taken rocks and they would throw it at the painting and now damaging all of the detail that was once so amazing. Now going forward during World War II, there was a bomb that dropped very close to that dining hall and it further threatened the survival of the painting. So hidden beneath the challenges of history, the neglect and the intentional damage was this last supper. Once so brilliant, now layered with life. And the question would be, could it ever be restored? And there were seven significant attempts to restore it, but it wasn't until the late 80s that a group of brilliant artists started a detailed process. And they went with these special magnified lenses, spec by spec, line by line square by square until by 1999, there was a full restoration. Here's, here's a picture of the damage. Now this, this is even after it had been brought forward at some level of restoration. Then here's the print of the full restoration. And so by 1999, it had been restored and here's what is written about it. 500 years of neglect and abused, restored, but so carefully going piece by piece, spec by spec. And now once again, it is returned to its original. Now you can take that picture off the screen and let me say this. Maybe there's some men in the room and you feel so far from God's intent for you. Maybe you feel that life has happened and you're beneath the layers of neglect. The image of God in your life has been dulled, diminished. The purpose of your life practically lost because of all that has happened. I am saying to you that God is a master builder and that God is a master artist. And there's no one like God, no one compares with the power of God to go line by line and compartment by compartment of your soul through the light of his Holy Spirit shining on even those, those areas that have been closed off for years because what happened? God is able to go even there and start this amazing restoration in your life to where once again you can know with confidence you are who God 
created you to be, and you can do what God created you to do. And I've, I'm not here to talk about the strategy of how all of that would happen. I want a revelation to hit your heart today because I think it's the only way it happens. There must be a fresh reminder or revelation in your life of the profound love of God that's greater than fear and greater than the past, greater than anything that you have done or what has been done to you that has kind of caused the light in your life to dim. God, through the power of his love, hear these words. God loves you. You are his son. He loves you. He's proud of you. And if that can catch to the depths of your soul, for some here who've had an earthly father that was affirming, loving, said it, lived it, that is so easy for you to embrace. And even if you have messed up, there's still this understanding within you that your dad didn't want you to veer off the path, but your dad never stopped loving you, and you know it. But some in the room, you have no concept of that. And if you have no concept of an earthly father that loves you, that assures you of that identity as his son and that is proud of you, then you can project that concept onto the heavenly father and you can struggle that God actually does call you son, loves you and is proud of you. You add to that that we live in this performance-based culture. And then you add to that that religion will only tell you to try harder. That if you're gonna come out from under all that, you're gonna have to work your way through it, which is impossible. Performance, the NFL combine, they measure how fast a, an athlete can run, how high they can jump. They measure their strength. I was watching the Razorbacks in the baseball game yesterday playing Stanford. Was that a shout out over here? Did, did anybody else hear that? Was that just me? Or did you hear that? Uh, so Stanford pitcher threw a pitch and one of our, our players, our players, I'm from Arkansas, Razorback, and the guy knocks it out of the park and the commentator said, now we're gonna put a measure on the pitch and they could measure the spin of the ball. And measuring the spin of the ball, they then compared it to what a professional pitcher would do. And the professional, his ball has so much more spin on it that by the time it reaches home plate, it drops four inches. This college player didn't have that spin, and so the ball stayed up in the strike zone. And it became a great pitch to knock out of the park. The commentator then said, if this pitcher cannot increase the rotation, he will never pitch at the next level. Everything's performance. They can measure the velocity in which the ball comes off the bat. We know as men that in this culture, there's, it's the try harder, it's, it's so performance based. And I don't have a performance plan, I don't come with a game plan to bring your life out from the layers of struggle or sin or pain. I come with a revelation. God loves you. You're his son and he's proud of you. The natural mind would say, he can only be proud of me when I'm restored. And that's why this has to be a revelation because that's not God. God loves you right now. You can't do anything to make him love you more. Get that in your heart. He loves you for you. He doesn't want you covered over in all of that. He doesn't want you going in a path that leads to destruction, but he loves you. And there is nothing more powerful. There is 
no set of steps more powerful than the life-changing love of Jesus, the life-changing love of God to think that you could leave here knowing he loves me for me, not my performance. I think it's, I think it's with any son's heart to want to make their dad proud. I want to make my dad proud. And I do want to make him proud with how, how I live and what I do. But I'm grateful that he raised me to understand that he's proud of me because I'm his son. And then I know that as I read the Bible, that's the heart of God. And I'm after that man today that didn't have that affirmation and now that it's hard for you to conceive of a God that would just say, you're my son. I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm not looking at your batting average. I'm not looking at the scoreboard. I'm looking at you. You're my son. Somebody needs to hear it. You're my son. I love you. I'm proud of you. As I would play sports, it was great to have the support of a dad. And there's something about that that stays with me. There were times we were losing. Many times. He was still cheering. If you're as far as you've ever been from God, God's still cheering you on. Not in the life you're living, not in the scoreboard, not in your actions. But you're his son. Jesus wrote a story so that we could have an, a proper concept of God. When the son, who was as ruthless as a son could be in wanting his inheritance early in that culture, and then took that inheritance and in doing his own thing was far from home and wasted it. And in that day, he was basically saying, dad, I wish you were already dead and money was in property. And that meant that father probably, probably had to liquidate property to give the inheritance early. I mean, you just go down the line of how deeply that would have cut the father but so that we would have the proper concept of God, we see that the father was there looking over the horizon every day going, is this the day that my son comes home? And on that day that the son was making his way, the father broke with being that patriarch of the family and with the cultural norm and the father is seen running to the son and when he gets to the son he embraces him and one reason is because the people of the village had they gotten to the son first they had the right to kill him for what he had done and this is the father saying you have to come through me his son had prepared what to say when he got to the father but if you read it he never lets the son say a word. He just looks at those around him and said, get me a new pair of shoes. Get me a robe and get the signet ring of this family. And oh, get the party ready. My son has come home. This is before he's been able to say, I'm so sorry. This is before he's been able to repent. This is before the son who was going to say, I, I don't deserve to even live in the home. Just let me live somewhere close because anywhere back in the vicinity is better than where I've been. And the actions of the father, each one of them are messages 
You know, you are my son. And you have all the rights of a son. And these shoes, that ring says you're my son. And these shoes say, you go on in the destiny that is laid out for your future. This performance-based mindset can never understand that. Because what I've just described to you is grace. Grace. And God is not performance driven. Get a praise ready. He is grace driven. Come on. Oh, give him a great praise. He, hear it. You're his son. He loves you. He's proud of you. Let me say it again. You're his son. He loves you. He's proud of you. So this magnificent picture that we find on the top of the mountain after God speaks, Jesus says to the disciples, hey, Peter, I know you want to stay, but we have to go. And they come down the mountain. And when they get to the bottom of the mountain, this is, this is the text that I read. When they came to the crowd, a crowd was at the bottom of the mountain. And there Jesus, radiating in both the love of God and the power of God. And out of the crowd comes a dad. The dad kneels at the feet of Jesus and cries out on behalf of his son. He says, my son, he has a history. It involves, where he throws himself into the fire. He throws himself into the water. Something's going on with my son. No one's been able to help my son. And Jesus is bring him to me. And he was healed that very moment. So I've got a challenge today, first of all, for just a man to know you're a son, that you're loved and God's proud of you. The second challenge would be, is there a dad in the room that would come out of the crowd? See, I don't know how many dads were in that crowd that day, but I know one dad came out of that crowd to Jesus. I looked at all the dads as you stood up today, and I wonder if there's a dad that needs to come out of this crowd and get to Jesus on behalf of your son or your daughter. And I want you to come in your desperation, but not out of fear, out of faith, because Jesus is able. The same love and power that was at work in Matthew 17 is at work in this room today. And if it's not, I don't know why any of us came. Because I'm not here to give you a TED talk, a motivational talk, a self-help talk. Self-help hadn't made a difference in that man's son. And yet his son had a future. And he had a dad willing to come out of the crowd and say, can you help my son? And Jesus said, bring him to me. One man, one dad coming out of the crowd. I wish there were chapters about the rest of that son's life. He couldn't have held down a job in that situation. He couldn't have had relationships that functioned in that condition. He couldn't have been a husband or a father in that condition. But I wonder if we had the chapters would we read of a son who went on to thrive in the destiny of God for his life. 
in the relationships that could work, in a life, in a career that could succeed, in a marriage that was awesome, in a family that was blessed, all because a dad stepped out of the crowd and said, Jesus, can you help my son? So there will be an opportunity for any dad that's carrying a burden for your son or your daughter to come to the altar today. And we'll talk to Jesus. Thirdly, could we see this man coming out of the crowd as symbolic of every Christian man? And could we see the son symbolic of the next generation? And could we as men come out of the crowd in faith and humility for the next generation and call out to Jesus for them. I don't have to go down the entire list, but you know that pornography that enters your son or your daughter's life at a young age, now the average age of pornography viewing every day is the age eight. We now have the studies that show that when that son or daughter gets married, they're already burned out in their brain and it creates a lot of dysfunction in their marriage. We have a society, a next generation that's drowning in drug addiction and depression. We see the spike in suicide among the next generation. And I wonder if we could come out of the crowd today and come to Jesus on behalf of the next generation because we don't want to stand for them being drowned by depression or burned out by addiction. Can I get an amen? And I want you to see this today. What was burning that young man out, what was drowning him, when a man stepped out to Jesus in one moment, in the magnificent power and love of Jesus, that son was healed. So I've got to stand on a firm foundation and say, the power and love of Jesus is more powerful than the addictive influence of present day culture. That the love and the power of Jesus is more powerful than the influence that is trying to depress and demoralize this next generation. That the power of Jesus can bring clarity to all of the confusion wrapped around identity. Give me a man who'll come out of the crowd to Jesus for the next generation. Will you be the man? I'll be the man. Will you be the man? Worship team come, remain standing everybody. Worship team come. Oh God, we honor you today and your presence. We are humbled that you are faithful and able and available. I ask for the leading of the Spirit in the lives of men today. We recognize that this is not just another day. We're standing in providence. And if we can respond Accordingly, then this can be a day where the layers of history and sin, shame, and pain are met by the divine love of a father. And restoration starts today. If you would say, I'm that man that just needs a work in my life. I'm that man that needs to experience 
the help of the Heavenly Father. I'm caught in a performance trap. It spoke to me when you mentioned that He loves me for me. I need the power of that love in my life. This will be the catalyst for the amazing things that God wants to do in your life. If that is you, just find the nearest aisle right now and come and just kneel at this altar. Right now, just step out. You know who you are. The performance trap, like a cage, it gets open today. You walk out of that and you're set free and restoration starts by the profound love of God to you, His Son. He loves you. You are His Son. Hear this. He is proud of you. Speak that, Lord, to these men. Secondly, is there a dad in the room? And you're bearing a burden for your son, your daughter. There's something going on. You see it seeking to burn them out, to drown them in issues. And you're bearing a burden. And you say, I, I got to come out of the crowd today for my son, my daughter. Just come right now and find that altar. Come as quickly as you can. doubt that every man coming right now you have probably prayed more times than anybody could count I commend you I respect you for praying again praying again pressing into God again finally are you one of those incredible men that would say, I'm going to step out of the crowd on behalf of the next generation. I will pray. I will live in such a way as to provide a witness of the power of Jesus, the love and the freedom that he gives so that the next generation can have a vision of what life can be like. And instead of being burned out and drown out they will have vitality they will have purpose they will have identity in Jesus I hope that's every man but I just need a man I hope it's every man but I just need a man that'll come out of the crowd today is that you would you come you say I'll be that man I will be that man That's it. Just talk to him. Talk to him. Talk to him. Jesus. Build. The word of the Lord is build. The word of the Lord is build. You're building an altar right now. You're building on the foundation of the love and the power of Jesus. And that will cause you to be built to last. In the name of Jesus, you are built to last. Then you can make disciples out of who you are. Young men, that are going to be built to last. And ask this team as we seek the Lord just to come in 
to that powerful bridge that says we will build on the love of God, which is a firm foundation. God, give us a, a, a depth of understanding and experience of your love today. We're talking about strength. We are talking about power. We're talking about something that's greater than fear and everything else greater than sin, greater than the past is the profound love of God. Seek him today. Press in, we're not in any hurry. 